All right, well, it looks like we're pretty much at capacity now, most of the back. There may be still a few seats in the back uh, for those of you who are coming in. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to a panel discussion on what's next in network virtualization. We've got a great panel this afternoon. Um, I'm Eric Hanselman uh, of 451 Research. We've got, from this side, uh, of course, I've got, oh, I've got it right up here, uh, Balji Sibisarmanian from uh, Cisco. Uh, Dan Mihai Dimitriou uh, from Mitakura, uh, Mike Cohen from Big Switch, uh, the Nachi Ueno from NTT, and uh, Ahiro Motoki, uh, Mo excuse me, uh, Motoki from NEC Central Labs. So we're going to kick it off with a set of questions. Uh, we're going to have a little time for audience questions at the end as well. So keep your thinking caps on and uh, see where we go from here. So uh, I wanted to start off with a, a little bit of background in SDN and network virtualization broadly. Uh, we've come through a time period where we've gotten used to what SDN is all about. We've sort of in the midst of a pretty hefty hype cycle right now in terms of a lot of the messaging that's going on. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about here today and, and get the opinions of our panelists is really what's coming next, what are the realities, and where does this fit within OpenStack today? Uh, as we stand on the, the cusp of Grizzly um, you know, with Folsom, we finally got a, a fully fleshed out network abstraction with the Quantum Project. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of places we can go with this. So uh, we're talking about sort of where that fits and, and where we're headed. So to start off with, uh, we seem to be a switch, uh, a, excuse me, a split in the uh, approaches to SDN. Uh, we start out with a lot of enthusiasm for OpenFlow is really sort of one of those initial manifestations of, of what we could do with low-level network control. Uh, and we've moved on to an appreciation of a greater interest in overlays. Um, there had been a lot of resistance initially to overlay technologies like VXLAN and NVGRE, but we've gotten to a point at which we're starting to see that those may be useful abstractions and useful ways to be able to connect. Um, where do you see each of these technologies fitting, um, and are there use cases that are appropriate to individual approaches to this, or is this something where we really need to be some mixing and matching as we move forward? So. Uh, We'll start in a nice linear order. Uh, Paul, do you want to head off? Yeah, sure. I think uh, if you look at the, uh, what, what does a customer really want to achieve is sort of uh, driving what some of the things we do. Um, I think there's definitely a trend towards uh, automating the network along with the rest of the stuff in data and storage and compute. So an open flow is a small budget that you have you know, in trying to do data plane management. And uh, as you start building uh, the real solutions that you want to build, uh, you need to have various solutions, right? Uh, overlay is one aspect to building solutions uh, where you abstract away the network, physical network, and build an overlay network on top of it. And the advantage you get, I guess, is in some ways is you get it fast and quick at software speeds. But I think what we at Cisco believe is that uh, eventually you need to have the physical network being fully integrated into the overall orchestration part of it. Um, so if you look a year out or so, you know, or so, you know I think you know you you would see more uh, fully orchestrated through OpenStack is still sort of the orchestration layer, the cloud orchestration layer, but you would have physical as well as virtual network being completely orchestrated end to end. So you don't have to worry about should I do an overlay or should I not do an overlay. It, it should be about you know is it does your network support your needs, which is building a, a self-service portal or, or fast. Uh, Cloud deployments. Yeah, we'll hand it off to you, uh, someone who's a little more overlay focused. Yeah. Right, yeah, we're entirely overlay focused, so forgive me if my answer sounds biased, but. Um, so for building virtual networks for tenants, for in a multi-tenant environment, I believe that overlay is definitely the right approach because the, the, the state and the data is only, only concerns the edge. It doesn't really concern the core of the network. Uh, as far as OpenFlow itself goes, I think Balaji touched on the, on the point a little bit. It's all about the benefits to the customers. So initially, maybe there was a lot of excitement about OpenFlow as a solution, but the problem itself might have been mischaracterized. The problem is, I believe, that 
customers want to automate network configuration and, and provisioning, even of the physical network. But to automate the physical network does not automatically lead to the conclusion that we need to centralize the control plane functions. So if you can have the tried and true decentralized control plane based on things like OSPF, BGP, and so on, but have a good way to automatically configure these things, then I think you don't necessarily need the central control plane like uh, in OpenFlow. So, uh, so obviously, our take on this is you know, probably you know, a little bit in between in that you know, overlay technologies have been excellent in the network virtualization industry as being something easy to deploy, a great starting point for people to consume the technology because it works on your existing hardware in, a, in kind of a non-invasive way. Um, however, as Balaji said, it really doesn't solve the entire problem. It really leaves you with um, you know, two separate management planes now. You actually have, uh, you know, to manage your overlay networks, um, you, know, you have a set of them, you have allocated different tenants, and still manage and maintain your physical network. So you've actually now duplicated, you, you know, two separate problems where before you had one. Um, so by integrating these technologies and actually, you know, having, you know, open, open stack orchestration and quantum orchestration be able to reach down directly to the hardware, you know, we see that as the direction this technology really needs to go on in the long term. And, you know, as Big Switch, that's the direction we're going with our technology um, as well. Um, in terms of, of OpenFlow, which has been discussed uh, so far, you know, we're actually much more bullish on OpenFlow than, um, than folks have been previously. Uh, and, you know, the reason is, you know, we see OpenFlow as a way to offer a standard protocol. Um, and, you know, and actually having that standard becomes very important because it, it offers a degree of interoperability that has not been present um, in, in the networks before. Um, and also the idea of a cent you know, centralized management um, offers a lot of operational benefit that have also not been realized in, in networks previously. Uh, so obviously, you know, OpenFlow is not the end-all be-all be all, um, for network virtualization. It will not be the only technology employed, but it actually can be a very, very useful tool um, in integrating physical and, and virtual domains in a network virtualization platform. Okay, so uh, we are carriers, so we have very large VPN networks, so maybe VPN is a kind of virtualized network, so we have the main history of the managing virtual, virtualized network. So what's new to the SVN is uh, for me, quantum is really important because it, we can share the tenant-facing view of the client use case on the quantum, then we can realize it to the actual network. <laughs> so we are focusing on uh, investigating many technologies, including overlay technologies, open flows, and now we are uh, focusing on the BGP-based SDN overlay. So which we actually we do it many experience with BGP and PLS and stuff. So we are uh, investigating to expand it to the inside data center. Then we can manage uh, all network by senior operations. So actually, one of the drawbacks of the overlay technology is the burden for the operations. So operators should manage the two layers. But if we choose the MPLS BGP for the overlay, so the burden will be actually uh, decreased for the operators. I think overlay technology and open flow can coexist. Uh, overlay network is uh, modeling, <coughs> uh, network modeling which defines how to transfer the packet, um, keeping the separation of multiple networks. On the other hand, open flow is a way to provision, uh, provision a network equipment. Uh, open flow can use to define rules. Packets from A should be forwarded to transfer the virtual network X. Uh, in addition, open flow brings an open standard way to control uh, network switches. So many um, equipment or software which can talk, open flow are released. By open flow, we can control and monitor um, our network as a whole in a centralized way. So I believe both technology can coexist from now. Well, we've heard some different perspectives on where this fits. I think uh, one of the things I'm hearing sort of across this is that management winds up being one of the concerns in terms of bridging both uh, an overlay capability and underlying network control. 
Uh, if we, we have to get to overlay again, you at the edges, be able to either tunnel between data centers or be able to transit across the, the virtual edges we created. Um, does it make sense to just do overlay the entire way? And why not live with a lot of the difficulties or potential challenges and maybe some of the performance issues? Um, isn't that a, a better path? So, uh, let's, okay, so we'll start with you first. We'll roll it back the other way. Both in the overlay networks <laughs> and lower level projoning, like open flow, uh, important, as I said before. So provision and managing the physical switches are still a key to control the network performance, like QoS or bandwidth. So the network, um, so um, network controller should um, pretty this role and hide the detail of physical switches. So uh, overlay is uh, not the uh, solve the old problem. <laughs> I okay. Well, it's, uh, actually, Mr. Melody, I'll kick that back over to you. Being a little more hardware perspective, is, is hiding the details of the, the underpinnings of the physical network a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, do we really have to know about the guts of it? And what's an open flow developer got to know about what that, how that fits together? So sure. I, think, I think, again, I'll, I'll come back to the what, how the customer would eventually run and deploy this network, right? So they have physical network, they have these virtual networks. I mean, they have these virtual switches as well as physical switches, physical devices. He needs to still maintain the whole thing. Um, I think the approach that, you know, for Dan, I mean, being a software vendor, it's, you know, that's, that's the con control point that you have, and it's perfectly a legal way, to, I mean, it's perfectly acceptable business practice, business model, to say that makes sense. But from a customer point of view, they have both. And as a vendor who actually has, by the way, don't characterize as just as hardware vendors. Well. <laughs> you know, we have virtual edges that we have hypervisor switches that runs across all uh, hypervisor platforms. And so we have the ability to provide both. So if you have the option to choose a p platform or solution that, that provides you end-to-end -end visibility, end-to-end -end troubleshooting, why not? So I mean, do, don't choose it based on your business model or business practice. All right, well, Dan, that. I might have something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you might, but yeah. Well, we'll no, I, I think I, I agree that overlays do not solve the whole problem. Definitely not. Uh, that said, the rest of the problem, how to manage the physical networking, I think there are various ways to skin this cat, right? And we're probably not going to come up with the right architecture here today. But what I'm saying is I don't think that we need to do open flow. That's not the only way to solve that problem. And in fact, some of the, some of the things that uh, Motoki-san touched on earlier are things like provisioning QoS and things like that. Actually, you can't do that with OpenFlow anyway, right? You can't provision QoS traffic classes and things like that right now on switches with OpenFlow unless you've made some extensions, which some vendors might have. Um, so I agree, we need a way to be able to do that, to automate that. Um, there's no standard API for that right now. On the other hand, many switch platforms are becoming more open, running Linux, so you could probably write your own software you know, and orchestrate it in that way. I, I just think that there are multiple ways to attack this problem, and maybe one, one single solution from a vendor like Cisco, maybe Cisco has the capability to build that one solution using in their own ecosystem, but in a multi-vendor ecosystem, I think it's, we, there is no solution right now. You know? And it might not be one single software control platform that handles the whole thing, Maybe quantum is the thing that ultimately brings them together, you know, to, to manage the overlay and the underlying network, maybe. So I think regardless of, you know, how this debate ends up playing out, hardware acceleration, you know, hard, you know hardware acceleration in you know, some kind of network virtualization technology is going to become incredible, is going to become important. Um, you know, tunneling in software is just not a sufficiently efficient solution, um, you know, to, to long term take over this market. Um, you know, that, so, you know, if, if you come to that conclusion, there's a number of places you, you can go to it. You can say, well, you know, if, if overlays are the answer, then switches should understand how to in-cap and decap packets. Um, and that's, you know, that's one direction the, the market can go. You know, the other, you know, um, and, and, it, and actually you already see vendors actually adopting technology like that. Um, and, I, and, you know, I think that's actually very benef that's beneficial to, to everyone. 
Um, in fact, it's not even opposed to open flow technology. So fundamentally, OpenFlow talks about having this centralized control plane um, you know, and, send in, and creating a standard about how it speaks to switches. Now, you know, some of that standard could actually be about encapping and decapping packets, for example. So it could, it could live alongside encapsulation technologies. It's not like you have to choose one or the other. Um, now, it's true that in an all OpenFlow network, you may choose not to use an encapsulation method for, for many reasons, but you can actually run both technologies alongside. It's not going to be a pure black and white. Um, you know, answer long term. Um, but I do think, you know, harder acceleration of these capabilities will absolutely be essential to, to keep networks functioning at line rate. Thank you, Zan. Comments from a carrier perspective. And I think what you'd identified about being able to do overlay in carrier class yeah, capabilities yeah. like MPLS. Or so actually, so we can we can use many technologies for the maybe one customer wanna use uh, MPLS, one customer wanna use maybe BXN or something like that. So uh, as uh, Dan said, OpenFlow is not only an answer. So maybe we can cooperate with multiple technologies. So uh, we propose the meta plugin for the quantum. Uh, by using meta plugin, we can uh, each uh, quantum network has flavor. So flavor corresponds to each vendor plugin or open source plugin. So we can use and um, provision many types of the network on the one single control plane. Uh, by this control plane means the quantum. Because quantum managing tenant facing the models and provision it to the action network. So one, one plugin may be open flow based, one plugin may be netconf based. So that can be managed. So actually, let me do a quick level set with the audience. Uh, how many people have actually gotten their hands into the quantum project today, or actually living with plugins in one form or another? Can we get a quick show of hands? All right, good. So we've got a reasonable depth here, uh, which actually leads me to what I think is sort of a, an interesting next step. You talked about meta plugins. Uh, have we gotten to a state in quantum right now where there's too many plugins? I mean, it seems like you know, from a, a a high level perspective, you know, every veteran on the, on the planet is putting together a quantum plugin. How are they going to handle virtual networking? It'll be in a quantum plugin, right? So, uh, especially when we look at things like you know, net state databases and a lot of the how do we expand in a much larger environment? Uh, have we gotten to a world in which it's getting a little too fractured right now? And, and it sounds like, Nitrosan, you'd say definitely with a, a if you're looking at metas, uh, looking at, met, at a meta plugin. Yeah, basically, so we welcome the newcomer for the plugins. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it is also has responsible to the pushing code to the, because of for the maintenance. So lack of the document or no pro, nothing to be tried, way to the try. So something like just buy this uh, product is uh, not the way. So yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that Cisco already has a plugin where we plug into multiple different uh, underlying stuff on, on, on our side. You know, we have a Cisco plugin which has UCS plugin, Nexus plugin, Nexus 1K plugin, and a few other plugins. So you know, we already uh, have developed that technology. That's already, I guess, the Lou is there, and he has, uh, he's worked on, uh, you know, providing. I think it's probably a blueprint. I think something coming down the road where you can plug in multiple plug multiple quantum plugins into a quantum plugin. So. You know, I, I guess from my perspective. We have the plug-in, plug-in, plug-in. <laughs> Recursion is your friend. Yes. From my perspective, I don't really see too many plugins as a, a problem. You know, it, it certainly, you know, you know it, it creates a management issue from a code perspective is that, you know, if they're all actually pushed into quantum and someone QAs them all and now there's something to maintain. Um, and that being more of kind of a, an open source management issue where it might make more, you know, you move them out and, and manage them separately. But I actually think from, you know, from an open stack perspective, from a customer perspective, the best thing we can have is, you know, any event, you know, any vendor solution you might want to work with should actually work with open stack and work with quantum. And I actually think that's the, the best of all worlds. Um, and then it's actually the, you know, then it's the, you know, the, the vendor, you know, the vendor's challenge to actually make their technology relevant in quantum and actually show that it has a differentiated capability. Dan, were you yeah. hovering on the edge of a comment? Uh, Go I for am. it. I, I, I think your question about whether there are too many plugins boils down to are there too many vendors? Right? <laughs> I mean, Quick show of hands, too many vendors? <laughs> too many vendors, okay. maybe, maybe there are. But don't worry, some of us will die off at some point. <laughs> at least the, uh, the startups. 
No, but, but seriously, I think... Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> I said some, not all. <laughs> You're getting votes of support here, so this yeah. is good. All right. No, but, but in, all, in all seriousness... Funding, we're, these, we take credit cards. We just got some, so we're still around. <laughs> um, the, the quantum plugins that are there right now, they, they don't all do the same thing. In other words, you can't really swap one out for another. You are adopting not just the quantum plugin, you're adopting a whole different architecture for the way that you, you design the network. And uh, what I was saying earlier is that right now there is no way other than the Cisco Franken plugin, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> to, uh, to integrate both control of the physical plane and the, uh, the overlay plane, if that's, what you, if that's what you're doing, from two different vendors. There's no way to do that right now. So perhaps we'll, we'll get to a standard for that at some point, maybe the meta plugin. I think I think the po I think uh, the point was, for example, uh, since you can only do one plugin, that plugin cannot actually solve everybody's problem. So unfortunately, you know, we have to expand that space, right? So you could argue which which is the right architecture, but uh, definitely there's no lack of there's no it, it, multi plugin is not a problem. Multiple plugins not a problem. I think quantum and SNN is an emerging phase, so overall growth is important. So now we are controlling, uh, gathering uh, many use cases through various plugins. So uh, I believe it contributes the progress of the network virtualization. And uh, these mod mm, many plugins mm, may be reviewed or refactored at some point in the future, but now it is a phase or to provide options to users. So I think I agree with all of you. So is this a problem that goes away if there's a greater definition to the abstractions that quantum presents? And I guess the, the other side of that is, do we wind up limiting our options if in fact we start to create more definition around what quantum offers? Oh, let me ask this question. So. Uh, Bob from Red Hat is working for the Mozilla L2 plugins. So in future, some plugin may provide the only L2 plugin can be one driver of the Mozilla L2 plugin. So we can uh, combine many plugins. So so something like that. In, for now, we gonna if we have a new function X, all plugins should be updated. But that's a Definitely problem, but uh, we are working for the majority. So L3 stuff, L2 stuff can be combined. So then we each plugin can uh, offer the new functionalities, which is adding on the communities. I guess the other comment I would make is that uh, you know I actually think Quantum has done a very good job to date at sort of choosing the right level of abstraction. Um, you know so. You know, the APIs are sufficiently abstract to define you know, the high level tenets of networking without you know, dictating that they map to traditional networking um, you know, structures or formulas, for example. Um, you know, they actually are sufficiently vague to support kind of new SDN architectures and tradi very, you know, very traditional switching architectures um, you know, that are relatively static. And I actually think that is the right level and it, it is not easy to achieve. Um, you know, I, you know, so kudos to you know the f the founding team members of Quantum. I actually think they've done a great job of you know finding that balance and actually maintaining it. I, I agree that the level of abstraction is is good right now, and that's mostly because the Quantum APIs focus on the tenant facing functions, right? So you got to make those abstract and and implementable by everyone. Where things get interesting, as I said, is when you start talking about the operator functions where the architecture really starts to become more visible rather than completely invisible as it is to the to the tenants and uh, that's where quantum is still weak on those areas and hopefully we'll be addressing those soon well and i was going to head to another question although you talk about the operator perspective um, that actually brings up an interesting point um, last year at the open networking summit uh, dave ward made the comment that resource control in networks is really important uh, because as, as he put it, you know, he sort of brought up Silverlight as an example where you can dial up performance and it's left open to the developer to be able to pick you know, what they want in terms of performance. And of course, you know, if there's a knob that goes up to 11, every developer is gonna say, hey, it's turned up to 11, right? 
Um, as, his, as he put it, um, he did not want to cede network control to a bunch of drunken frat boys coding Farmville apps. Um, <laughs> It, is there a, a, is there capability, uh, I'm presuming from the operator side, or, or more that we need to do within quantum to be able to manage some level of the resource allocation pieces? And, and if so, does that need to integrate with upper level management? Is that orchestration? You know, where do those kinds of the, the resource management pieces fit you know, in, in, within OpenStax? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, right now, most of the solutions are day zero provisioning solutions, uh, where you click, 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 you got a, you got a tenant set up but you don't know where the VMs are getting placed and, and how does the physical network, for example, um, are behaving. And, and the thing, the beauty of the thing is, it's not just day zero, it's day one, two, three, four, five, six. And how does your app behave every day? If your app behaves perfectly today, but then that does not turn off tomorrow because of some congestion, because VMs could be moving around and things like that. So I think the, that's a thing that nobody talks about. Right now, hey, there's no maturity of the solutions that you actually worry about that. Right now, it's more like, hey, can I get something up and running? Hey, that's cool, right? Now, um, in a real production enterprise environments, uh, you need to worry about app performance consistency. And so having that good tie-in between the physical and the virtual and the network resource issues will definitely come into play. It's not coming into play today because nobody has, um, I mean, it, there's a few instances. We simply haven't hit those yeah, limits yet. We haven't hit those limits, so. If, if I understood the question correctly, uh, just make sure I did, you know. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. I, you're talking about whether arbitrating access to shared resources that are limited, you know, is something that you want to leave up to the developers, essentially, the, the drunken frat boys, right? But I, I think that anytime we have a scarce resource that we're trying to allocate, some sort of pricing has to come into effect, right? So pricing is something that where we can provide differentiated services using that. So if somebody wants a faster network, they gotta pay more. Uh, in that sense, sure, give them the access and then we can design something that takes pricing into account and available resources and, well, prices accordingly, right? So in that sense, I don't feel like giving this level of programmability to the, to the users, the tenants, is a problem as long as the system, perhaps quantum, can arbitrate those. Well, I think that's my larger question. Is that something where quantum arbitrates it? Is that a larger resource construct that exists within OpenStack? Well, it, it could be. I mean, we, we don't have that yet as a, as a concept in quantum like that of uh, different classes of services, but uh, perhaps we'll be, we'll be going there. Yeah, I guess I see this as a you know, direction quantum probably should go in the future. You know, and it sort of takes the form of you know, provi you know, provider tools to actually, you know, you know, manage tenant resources, and again, at an abstract level, um, but you'll be able to defi you know, you know, define different um, levels of resource for different tenants and actually have the underlying network enforce that in, in, you know, in whatever way it, it can. Um, it actually touches on the larger point of um, sort of bringing, you know, you know, bringing you know, effectively server administrator teams together with uh, you know, teams that have been managing network separately. Um, and actually having them work together so you can offer these APIs because you know, any API you create here will actually, you know, will in inherently touch the, the physical network. Um, so you'll actually need coordination between multiple different groups to, to achieve it. Uh, so in the Grizzly, so Quantum has a schedule of functionalities. I think this is a great improvement. So we can schedule actual resources and uh, we have multiple uh, routers on the DHCP agent on the scheduled matter. And uh, I think there's also session about the integrating Nova scheduler and Cinder scheduler, quantum scheduler. So I think the scheduling is the big key on the cloud because uh, uh, we can utilize the use of the uh, uh, hardware's networks. So maybe I'm, we are also very interested in the improvement of the scheduling, uh, gathering many uh, actual log or information from the cloud using maybe thermometer or some kind of big data analysis uh, platform. I have a very similar opinion as Ueno-san. Uh, I think mm, the network controller mm, should maintain and is responsible for network allocation, uh, resource allocation, uh, but the quantum, the API is important. So 
quantum needs to provide it. So compute and storage use network. So we need a way to request network to allocate uh, network resources. So uh, resources. So the API is very important. So quantum should provide it. In addition, uh, I expect uh, network distance among compute and storage is, you know, becomes a key factor to schedule computer storage. So it, uh, it is required to achieve the total performance. Uh, and actually, Motoki san you raise a really good point uh, about distance and the physical nature of networks that start to come into play. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about hybrid deployments. And to clarify things, when I talk about hybrid, I want, uh, want to identify cloud capabilities in some way and then connected to some sort of back end that's either hosted, managed, colo, what have you, but at least you know, outside of that cloud environment. They may be in the same physical facility, but you've got to span that gap you know, out of the cloudy world. Um, there are a lot of challenges in terms of really identifying real underlying network performance when you start to make that jump. Um, how do you deal with that in an OpenStack world? And what are things that we're either working on now or are starting to, to look towards in the future that could handle that? And we can start back from, from your side, Motoki, we'll if that works. In my opinion, the network co uh, connectivity between data sensors uh, should be a part of virtual network. So if we define a virtual ten, uh, network across the data center, the network controller mm, provision a network, uh, provision a network connection across data, uh, data centers uh, in addition to provision in a data, inside the data center. Mm, I believe it provides a simple view uh, it is important to provide a simple view to users. Um, now we are developing this concept on top of the open call controllers. So, mm, I think it achieved this uh, modeling of network connectivity among several sites and delegation mechanisms. Yeah, I agree with uh, uh, Motoki-san. Uh, but uh, the answer is quite simple. The VPN we are doing nowadays, <laughs> connecting many sites using VPN. So, and also we are working the VPN virtualization, but not, not virtualization, the VPN support for the quantum. Uh, many guys are joining the session. We have session tomorrow uh, evening, so please join. Uh, so, so we have so many wide variety of the VPNs using, if we choose the MPLS BGP, so, Actual connection will be the uh, uh, tune up using the best path selections. Also, uh, so the, the answer is quite simple for us. Yeah, and no, I definitely think this is you know, you know one of the near term important items that you know, we certainly hear you know we're hearing over and over again from from customers that they're interested in. Um, and you know, there are obviously a number of technical challenges to solve as, as you get there. Um, you, you mentioned kind of latency speeds you know, as you operate across data centers. Um, but there's also you know, a question of um, is it what, you know, the same vendor's technology on both sides? Um, you, you're actually operating across different vendor's technologies. Um, so obviously you know, something like you know, VPN can work well. Uh, but you know, it depends if you're using a, you know, you know, tunneling protocols, making sure you're actually, you know, virtual networks are actually have coordinated information to sync across, you know, across these different environments, potentially across vendors, um, you know, can certainly be a, you know, you know a complicated problem. Um, and, you know, that's obviously where quantum can step in and actually make a bit, you know, you'll have a, you know, you'll be a big help in, in bringing us there more quickly. So, um, you know, the short answer for us is it's definitely, it's definitely top of mind. It's something we're working on. Um, and we're you know, hopefully going to be doing it with, with folks in quantum as well. That's the speed of light issues we start dealing with. You know, I also sort of figured that you know, if we've got a project name like quantum, we need to find some of those badly behaved neutrinos that the, uh, the LHC found and then just get over the speed of light stuff. So. Um, as these guys have said already, it, this is an important problem and people do want the, the hybrid cloud model. Uh, that said, can we really have a single controller that handles both both sides of the equation? Probably not, just as Mike said, maybe they're different vendors. There's certainly different administrative domains, probably 
certainly different failure domains. So these two things really are separate. And I think even within the same administrative domain of one provider, if there are multiple data centers that may fail independently, they probably should have their own separate control clusters. Uh, so it is a problem of orchestration and federation. Maybe Quantum can help with that. If everybody in the world is running OpenStack and, and Quantum, then uh, that would be great. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Someday um, soon? Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, definitely the customers are uh, starting to look at, uh, first, of, first of all, when they want to do, extend, obviously build a prior cloud and then extend to another data center. Right, that's the first step, right? Before they so start looking at multiple, single provider, cloud provider, and then multiple cloud providers. I mean, that's what they're going to get to. Like, I want to be able to move my workload within the data center, across the data center, my own data center, and then to multiple providers as well. Um, there are multiple things, issues, that which has got nothing to do with OpenStack that's there. Speed of light issues, uh, encryption issues, like, uh, security of the workloads in the cloud itself, uh, public cloud, you know, the data security, data performance issues. So there is a whole bunch of issues besides, you know, extending the L2 or L3. Or uh, another thing is, you know, the security policies, you know, you want to remove the VM. Do you get the same consistent performance for the workload? There's, I think this is probably a next year issue maybe. I think that's my honest opinion that um, people are definitely looking into it, but I think first steps first, right? To, to build it there and then uh, go beyond that afterwards. So for the time being, we've got those open stack edges and we, we do hard links beyond it and work from there. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we've got time to answer any questions that the audience happens to have. Uh, so we've got a microphone here. If any of you've got questions to ask of the panel, by all means, we're happy to take them. Any takers? All right, well, keep thinking, and I've, I've got no shortage of questions here, so. Uh, one of the challenges we faced in, in OpenStack, broadly, is just simply getting uh, a large enough volume of qualified people who understand the process in, in order to, you know, to, to keep things moving at the speed at which they, they ought to be able to go. Does Quantum and networking and capabilities that are there give us some tools to be able to solve some of these problems in networking? Are there ways in which we can approach that? Uh, or is this something that, uh, that we need to tackle new ways? So is this going to be a challenge, an even greater challenge in networking to get the right people into the right spots? Yeah, I think um, um, definitely I think the, this is a new for networking people, right? Uh, I've been a networking guy for a while. In the last couple of years, I've been installing OpenStack myself, so you know, it, it has definitely it's a it's a it's an experience, right? I think many of the networking people in the in the overall uh, networking traditional networking people are not familiar with it. There should be a um, sort of a migration of uh, skill set. I mean, sorry, a learning of skill sets from both sides. So, you know, the, if you look at the, the server admins or virtualization admins, they're not used to all the techni all the L3 gateways, L2 gateways, VPNs, internet. They don't deal with those before. Now they have to learn that. And same way, networking team has to learn this as well in terms of quantum APIs and things like that. I don't think there's a lot of knowledge in the networking side of the world. Uh, I think um, there has to be a bridge that happens between the two. Everybody needs to start learning Python? <laughs> Inevitably, yeah. <laughs> to, to Any network admins out there who know Python? Maybe a few of you? Um, I think maybe we, we went off on a, on, a, on a slight tangent, or maybe I will, you know, with respect to that. But definitely there's a big gap, I think, between the traditional networking folks and the DevOps folks, let's say. And I'm actually neither one, you know, my, my background in, in this space. Um, but as, as we architect the complete system, we need all of that knowledge, right? We need to be able to build the physical network. We need to be able to deal with these issues in the, in the virtual networking plane as well. Maybe by opening this up to the you know, uh, <laughs> frat boys coding uh, Farmville apps, you know, that will actually help to get people to learn more about the network that they may have assumed is under the total control of some team far away, you know, in a, in a dark basement, right? Yeah, just, you want to? Yeah, actually, maybe we'll take an audience question. Yeah, hi, Sorry, Luke oh. Tucker. Um, oh. I'm glad to hear that you guys have actually appreciated that we tried to get the abstractions right in which the reason why it's quantum, it doesn't have to do with entanglement. We would like to do that someday uh, to get over that pesky speed of light issue. It's but not in Havana? Um, we haven't figured that part out yet, or, or what the right abstraction for entanglement really would be actually at a distance. Uh, yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah. But, uh, but we started very simple, and we've tried to then, ver in, 
in a very small number of steps add incremental functionality as we're going forward. And um, what I wanted to find out from, from the, the panelists here, has that worked for you? We've, we've tried to really separate out, as, as you've expressed, what a developer sees, which is a very simplified, abstract view of networking. They're not going to understand different networking protocols, nor should they have to. But I want to make sure that we're also, as we're bringing up things, and we, I agree with you, we're running into now these issues, how does a operator interact with this? How do we start to set up some of these things? Um, we have mechanisms in for having extensions. Um, but I really wanted to find out from you guys are, is, is a quantum process. Uh, we're at the OpenStack conference, and a lot of this is us trying to get together to map out this next release and everything. And if there's any suggestions you might have that uh, how we either continue as we've been doing, if that's been working for you, or, or suggesting for how we might change uh, how we, we roll out the introduction and We've had these meta plugins issues and things like that, but is that working for you? And will it get us to that next step, which is, I think, important that we have to be able to start involving the operators and the system providers? Um, I guess I'll go first. You know, from our perspective, I would say um, you know we started out as outsiders from you know from the quantum perspective, um, and it took us some time to kind of fund our way in. You know, we wrote a plugin. Um, you know, some folks joined our team, and you know, um, you know, and, you know. There was a little bit of a warming process that happened, but once it did, it was you know we've actually found it to be a great group to work with. Um, so from kind of a you know kind of a process management perspective, um, you know I do think it's working well. It, you know it kind of takes the t traditional warming period of getting to know everyone and and earning your stripes. Um, you know in terms of the the work being done, I I also agree that you know I actually think it's the right size bite pieces that are you know being taken on you know you know being taken on. So you know, everyone realizes services are very important, and load balancer was taken on as sort of a prototype, and you know people are looking at firewall now, and I think that'll probably accelerate once you know once you get a couple sorted out, it'll be easier to take five at, five at a clip. Um, so I you know you know so far the the work coming out of quantum I think is you know at the right level of abstraction, and that's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. So um, you know I've been relative I've been pretty impressed with with the way it's being done. I think the process itself is fine. I think with respect to these operator features that we're discussing right now, my fear is that there's not that much incentive for vendors like, uh, like us and others to really work on that to make it abstract, uh, is, my, is my feeling. So what I've noticed actually is that, you know, even, even in our own uh, software, we've tended to say, yeah, we can propose a blueprint for a quantum extension, but we can just write this Python script that calls our API and does the same thing. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's it's horrible and lazy, but uh, because it doesn't involve the um, authentication authorization aspects that quantum should front for the tenant, it doesn't doesn't matter. It's all trusted right. on the provider side. Um, I guess there's just not that much incentive for us to be a good citizen in, in that sense. So we should probably involve the operators and be more deliberate about about that discussion. Make it a priority in order to get some, some standardized things out, like uh, L3 gateway, L2 gateway, and things of that sort, uh, which have been languishing a bit, you know, right? right. I mean, I think cause one of the other, you know, sort of secondary questions to that, uh, particularly oh. from the startups and everything, or new entrants in this, we're getting together as an industry to solve this, which is pretty unusual. And do you find that that's actually gonna be turning out to be a business benefit to you, being able to join this larger kind of organization to drive this thing forward rather than us each battling it out uh, individually? Yeah, I, I think it, it should be because right. the top question that everybody asks is, how do you differentiate from SDN Startup X uh, rather than what benefit does this provide to me as a customer? So we should probably do something more to educate the market about the overall benefit of what we're doing here. But, I guess we still have some fundamental disagreements, you know, so we'll, it'll well, take we some time. Well, we always will. Hopefully That's fine. we will. That's, That's creative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me answer two different questions. So uh, for the first questions, uh, we are also operators, so uh, we are going to the uh, proposed blueprint about uh, helping monitoring staff who help monitor the uh, diagnosis yep. of failure. So the second point is, uh, uh, what's the second point? <laughs> Well, whether it's benefiting you as a company. To yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, the, the largest point is that we can share the use case and tenant facing view. So then we can get many uh, companies support on the services. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have done. Thank you. All right. Well, we're actually just over our limit. Is it a really, really quick no, question? It's not a quick question. <laughs>
And then why don't just come on up, follow up with the panel afterwards. I'd like to get a quick round of applause for the panel. Uh, thank you all for coming out. So.